All right, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord for help uh, this morning in our Sunday school lesson. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you and your work. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Holy Ghost to be able to illuminate us and teach us with regards to uh, the end of the Lord's Prayer here in John 17. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially that salvation which was wrought through your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to continue our studies here in the Gospel of John. And we've been in John 17. So let's go there. John chapter 17. And we've been exposing the Lord's Prayer. And this is the actual Lord's Prayer, not what some people call the Lord's Prayer. And it's really a model prayer out there in a certain denomination. Okay. This is the prayer that Jesus himself prayed to the Father. And we know that there's a lot of important things that the Lord prayed for in his prayer to the Father just before he went to the cross of Calvary, okay? fulfilling his great role of high priest and manifesting part of that even at the end of his ministry. And we saw in the first five verses that he prayed about his ministry as prophet and thanked God for it because it's through that ministry that he was able to provide justification to us. And we discussed it in depth when we went through it, uh, but we noticed that justification, though we tend to focus on one primary point, which is us being justified by faith, so we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the reality is that justification is threefold. Because God manifests in the flesh, who's the one praying here in John 17, he was justified in the spirit, and that's part of why we get justified. That's the means by which it occurs. And us, during our walk with God, we get justified in the eyes of other men and women when they recognize and see our testimony for the Lord. Okay. If you're a man of God, it's known of you. You don't need to tell anybody. Okay. And then we continued and looked at uh, verses 6 all the way to verse 19 and noticed the Lord prayed for his own. He prayed for the 11 that were there with him in the upper room. And in that prayer, we saw a great focus in their sanctification in the Lord ensuring that his father would protect them and provide for them in this world as they went out to preach the gospel after his resurrection. And we went through that and noticed that just like with justification, sanctification truly is threefold, but we tend to focus on the part that applies to us which is the idea that we get sanctified in our walk with God as we choose to live for God and he grows in us. So we can show Jesus to others. God makes us more holy when we decide to decrease and we allow his son to increase in our heart. Okay. As the preacher says many times, when you get born again and saved, that is a sanctification of your soul. Okay. The one I just spoke of is you choosing to sanctify your spirit and your flesh on this earth. Because you technically serve the Lord in that spirit that he gave the new birth to. And in the future, as we know, your body will be fully sanctified at the adoption. So you're probably wondering, where am I going? Well, it's right there. Okay, Let's go to John 17, verse 20. I guess I'm showing you all this so we can recognize that it's not a coincidence that, that all these major items and basic doctrine of Christianity really derive from the prayer that Jesus gave to his Father. The reason why we have the rest of the New Testament and even the Gospel of John is because he historically prayed this. So you're seeing the Lord work within time and ensuring historically we would have the rest of the New Testament. So John 17 and verse 20, let's take a look at the end of the Lord's Prayer here. And the Bible says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made, uh, they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, that these have known that thou hast sent me. 
And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. And we see here in these last seven verses that the Lord also prayed for us today. He thought about you, Christian. I think it's very important to recognize that as we were going through the God, our, this chapter here during Sunday school, and I brought up all these spiritual applications that apply to us today, the reality is none of them are spiritual. Deep down, according to verse 20, they're actually historical. Every single thing he prayed for his disciples, you can apply to yourself directly. Neither pray, pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their, that's the 11th word. And we're reading one of the 11th word right now. See that? So it's deeper than that. This is literally doctrine, everything we're going through. And that's why I tend to stress that. We really wouldn't have the New Testament without this prayer. Okay? Uh, the Lord making the decision to take the time to ask the Father for this. Okay? There's a reality here. And we see as we went through this little section here that we read, we noticed that the Lord in the contest asked for us to be glorified by and through and in Him. And so that's why the general focus here is glorification. Okay? And this too is threefold. The first glorification happens when you're actually born again. Okay? Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Now many of us know the primary application, but I'm just showing you all these things are actually threefold. It just depends on who you're focusing on. Are you focus on yourself or are you focusing on what God's doing? That helps you see the differences here. Romans 8, verse 29, very famous verse, yeah. the Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, that's who God foreknew, he also did predestinate to be saved. That's not what the Bible says. Okay. So that ends Calvinism right there. Okay. To be conformed to the image of his Son. See that? If he foreknew you, and we're going to see as we go through, you're going to get called, and then you're going to choose to get saved. And then because you made that decision, you are now predestinated to be conformed to be like the Son of God. Not, not, to, not to be born again. That's not what it says. So oftentimes people read the word predestinated, and then they just kind of pontificate <coughs> whatever they want and don't finish the verse. Yeah. That's how you deal with, with that, that false doctrine. But continuing on, that he might be the firstborn, talking about Christ Jesus, among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Yeah. So God is calling people. And whom he called, them he also justified. See that? So if he called you and you responded, you got justified. And whom he justified, that happened when you got born again. It says there, them he also glorified. Okay. The reality is when you were born again, a supernatural event occurred where you received a miracle of God, the greatest miracle that God has ever done. So much so it required him to come down here and live for 33 years as a man and live the perfect sinless life. And then he chose to give it up for you. And you said, I want to receive that. That's a, there's glory there. See? Now, I think this is very important because Christian, if you recognize the glory in the new birth that you receive from Jesus Christ, you'll always reflect back to it. And it'll help you as you continue to live for God in sanctification and want to give glory back to him. Because you realize that he cleared a debt for you that you can never pay back. Manny, why do you always sing about uh, giving thanks to the Lord every single Sunday school morning? Well, that's why. Okay. Kind of do it every day, to be honest. I'm pretty sure that's true for many people here. Okay? But just in case you needed some help, make sure you do it once a week. Okay? <clears throat> Amen. And so the glorification continues as you walk with him in this present evil world. Go to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And verse 17. Amen, that's a nice call. Okay? We got a new clock up there. Looks like it's working. <laughs> Praise the Lord. First Corinthians six and verse seventeen. Cost just almost four dollars. Amen. Four dollars well spent. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So you, if you're born again, you're joined unto the Lord and you're one spirit with him. So as you walk with him, your spirit needs to conform to his spirit. He testifies and bears witness that you are his child. And through you walking with his spirit, you're able to give glory to him. Verse 20. 
This whole section talks about your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Reflect back on the glorification you got on the new birth where he redeemed you. That was the price. He gave his precious blood at Calvary. He gave his life to save you from your sins. You were bought with a price. Okay. Well, I was a bond servant to sin before. Yeah, now you're a bond servant of righteousness. Awake unto righteousness. Yeah. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, okay, which are God's. Okay. So now we're seeing, we usually use this verse for sanctification, but it's tied to glorification in the reality that when you choose to allow yourself to be sanctified by God, you are glorifying Him in the process. These things all roll together. And when other people see you living for God, you get justified in their eyes as one of those Bible thumpers. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, we'll keep it simple. No sanctification. That's fine. That's fine. Now, here's the glorification we all know. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. And this is the one we're waiting for. Yeah. This is the one we're all excited about. This is the one that should have happened yesterday in most Christians' minds. Yeah. Happens when I want. Yeah. Now, I want it to happen as well, but it's not going to happen what I want. Okay. It's going to happen when God's ready for it to happen. Okay. And we're getting closer, it's pretty clear. Okay. Some dark times we're in these days. But in Romans 8, verse 17, the Bible says, And if children and heirs, heirs of God, because you receive God, think, think about that, God lives in you, that's a big deal. And join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, that's in your walk with Jesus Christ here on earth, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall, see future, be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, where what happened inside of you will be manifest to everybody else. Okay. How will that manifestation occur? Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And when your body's redeemed, that's exactly when you get that new glorified body that's just like the Lord Jesus Christ, made out of flesh and bone and all these great things. Okay? Point is, people will be able to look at you and say, you're a son of God. Instead of having to reflect on your testimony to recognize that you're one of the Bible thumpers. They'll be able to just see it. Okay? You're worse than that. You're a child of the, of the king. Okay? And you're probably running that area in the millennium as well. Okay? You're walking royalty. There won't be any confusion in the millennium about that. Okay? Praise the Lord. And so going back to John 17... Now that we see the general reality of this chapter, and they usually be preached that way, now we'll expose and get into some deeper things. John 17 and verse 20. I'm going to go ahead and read this again. Neither pray I for these alone, talking about the eleven, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Okay. Like I said, the Gospel of John, John was one of the eleven. Peter, all these individuals. Have you believed on Jesus through the word of God? I believe so. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. See that? What a God. He thought about me before I ever thought about him. See that? That's the God we worship. Verse 21. That they all may be one. Okay. Let's take a look at that right there. That they all may be one. And here you see the seed, because the Word of God is the seed, right? This is a seed that resulted in one of the mysteries of God that we're called to be stewards of today, that was brought about and into detail through the epistles given by the apostles. Okay? And guess what? You should be faithful to this according to the Word of God. Okay? Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Paul just made all this stuff up. You sure about that? Yeah. Or are you not paying attention to the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. Ephesians 5 and verse 30, the Bible says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, that they all may be one. You see that? 
And it was through that sea that all of a sudden you get Ephesians 5. Remember, Paul received these revelations from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So you can see what this is going on historically. He prays for it in his ministry. He's about to finish his ministry of prophet, what a high priest. And he plans to fulfill it through one of his own, one of the apostles, Paul, giving us the scripture we're seeing here. But it's because the Lord took time to ask that they all may be one. And if you, we already read it, okay? we saw he wants them to be one the way he is with the Father, Christ and the church. Okay? Well, how does this mystery unfold? Okay. Well, that's correct. One of uh, Pastor Stone's Bible teachers go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, and we'll go ahead and read this wrong. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, okay? For by one water tank, we are all baptized into one body. That's not what the Bible says, okay? So I feel bad for that guy. I'm glad he's at least saved, okay? I have a feeling when I start going to Bible school myself, I'm going to have a lot of teachers like that. I need a lot of correction. But for by one spirit, I'll be lucky to get C pluses because they'll be mad at what I'm right, okay? For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made a drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. See? That all may be one in the body of Christ. And you're baptized by the spirit into the body of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes that great mystery occur, where Christ and the church are bound and <coughs> unified. Okay? You're part of his flesh and of his bones. And notice it said there, whether you be Jews or Gentiles, and this was a surprise historically. Okay. Ephesians 2 explains a little more, so let's go there. <coughs> Ephesians 2. Okay. Ephesians 2, we're going to go to verse 12. But this talks about how the Ephesians, they are in time past Gentiles, they are part of the uncircumcision. Okay. They did not receive the circumcision made with hands that the Jews did, and yet... Somehow they're part of the church, according to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, which means that the Lord in part prayed for Gentiles like us this morning, knowing that, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And yet while you had no hope and you were without God, God prayed for you. See that? Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that's between Jew and Gentile, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, the Jews and Gentiles, that's the twain, one new man, because they're all made one, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. That's why we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. By the cross, now you know how he did it, having slain the enmity thereby. Okay. So we're seeing the Lord basically praying that unbelievers like ourselves who've been without hope and without God would one day when they, the scriptures come and the Holy Ghost comes through his word, through another born again Christian, through that gospel track you found on the floor because people stepped on it. What have you? You picked it up. You read it. You recognize your need for the Savior and you trusted in him. And because of the Lord's prayer right there, you were made one with him in the body of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And from that moment on, yeah, even in 2020, you can still get born again. You can still get saved right now. The Lord's prayer is still efficacious. What a prayer. Yeah. Lord willing, my prayers have an effect for even 20 years, okay? Or even two minutes. You need the grace of God for it to have any effect at all, right? Okay. And the Lord's prayer seems to have everlasting effect. Go back to John 17. John 17. So we just saw the seed of one mystery. I wonder where my message is going. John 17 and verse 22. We're going to see the Lord give another seed here. Okay. And he says, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. 
I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And here the Lord gives the seed of the word, which results in another mystery. Notice that he's in them, he's in you. Okay. And the Father's in Jesus. And through the Father being in Jesus, and you in Jesus, you've been reconciled by one body into the church. Okay. And now there's a connection. You can talk and have relationship with the Father. And through that, the Father can perfect you. Go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Here's another mystery. Yeah. But notice the purpose of this mystery is we tend to stop at verse 27. Okay. The reality is that sentence continues. The Bible says, To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. We need this more than anybody. Which is Christ in you. Okay, I in them. You see that? The hope. Of glory. What's that hope of glory? Colon, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And then Paul continues, he says, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Yeah. And Paul says, What's his purpose as a prisoner in Jesus Christ to manifest these truths? the grace of God and bring it to the Gentiles so not only that they may be saved but that they can continue in the grace of God continuing to perfection to that prize and the high mark and the calling in Christ Jesus so, so the purpose of Christ being in you is to sanctify you because you know that future hope of glory that was going to be revealed in us in the future the fact that the Lord has a plan for your body, soul and spirit you don't have to wait you can have a piece of heaven right here as you live for the Lord. See that? And he can start that perfecting process right now. That's what the Lord was praying for. He didn't pray for you to just get born again and he wanted to leave you on the sidelines. Okay? There's a game to be played here and he wants you to be part of the team out there. Okay? You know, all these analogies come to mind. You can think of any sport. Okay? But the reality is we all have our pieces to play. But you got to go out in the field. That's the, that's the major deal. And the field is the world. And people, especially Christians, they don't want to go out in the world. They want to hang out on their lazy boys. Okay? Okay. Wait for the next Green New Deal or something. I don't know what's going on with all that. Okay? You need to get out and serve. Okay? And that's why the Bible says, and this is really why the devil has done his best to make sure nobody had the Bible. Okay? But the Bible says, because it's right here, King James Bible, the Bible's right here. No confusion. Okay? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is that it? No. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and it on, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The Lord's goal is to make you mature. That does not mean you're going to be sinless. It means you're going to be truly furnished unto all good works. You're going to go about doing good. You can't help speak the word of God. Those types of things. Because Jesus is in you. That's all he does. Grace and truth is what always came out of his lips. Um, go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. So Christ is in every single Christian trying to make that happen individually in your life. And he also has a plan for his entire church because that was part of the prayer here. Ephesians 4, verse 15. Yeah. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Yeah. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And the Lord knows as he continues to edify you so you can grow in grace and knowledge. And he exhorts you to go out and serve so you can grow in grace and knowledge of the Savior. And he provides you with comfort so you can understand the Lord and Savior walks with you. The Lord knew all this and provided for this. And that's why he took the time to pray that you would individually grow in grace and knowledge in the Lord's prayer. Saying, I'm in you. And the Father's in me. And I'm praying to the Father that he may perfect you through me. 
I want you to be more like me. I want you to be conformed to the image of my son, the Father says. Why is it predestinated? There you go. That's why. It wasn't before the foundation of the world. Yeah. That was predestinated because Jesus prayed for it in time. Okay. Now, there's some things that are before the foundation, no doubt about it, but that ain't one of them. People get all hung up. Are you changing? No, the definition is the same. You need to cut off the whole foundation of the world part. Predestined means what it is. It's destined beforehand. Okay? But there's no time before creation. So how can you predestinate before time exists? And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put that aside. Point is the Lord is praying. Okay. And this is why we're here. Okay? This is why I know when I'm up here this morning and I give the word of God, it's gonna have an effect. Not just on everybody who's hearing this, but also on me. Because the Lord wants us all to be perfected in him. Praise the Lord. Okay. John 17. John 17. In verse 24, the Lord continues and says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Be with him where he is. Question, Christian, did that happen when you were born again? Go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Why is it that when you get born again, you know that you know that you have eternal life and you can't lose it? Okay, well, interestingly, the Lord prayed that those that the Father would give him will be where he is. God. Ephesians 2 verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, past tense, and made us sit together in heavenly pray, uh, places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Notice you're already raised up there. How does that work? Well, that's what the Bible says. Okay? Now, how does it work? I'll make it simple. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He's not just down here with you. You're up there with him. Now, it's a lot, a lot deeper. But that's how you're sitting up there with him, because he's sitting up there at the right hand of the majesty on high. So if you're one with him, you're up there just as much as you're down here. Okay? Now, you can get into specifics. You, it's actually your life that's up there specifically, okay? but that's that's the deeper study. Yeah. Point is, the Lord prayed for it and it happened. How do I know I'm never going to lose my salvation? I'm already in heaven. That's how I know. The reason why you're confused about it is you may not actually be there. You need to get saved. Okay. Nine times out of ten, when somebody says those types of things, because they're not saved. Now, you're going to have some Christians are confused. Okay. And we work with everybody, whether they're confused or lost, it doesn't matter. The point is, if you don't recognize that salvation comes from the work that Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, fulfilled at Calvary, and you're trusting in his work to save instead of your own, you won't have eternal life and you won't be sitting by the grace of God in heavenly places. I have another verse here, Colossians 3, but I'll just go ahead and read it. This is all actually review for many of the, of the elders here. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Looks like I, I went ahead of myself. I guess I gave the answer. Your life, because you're dead, okay, Romans 6, and your life is hid with Christ, who's up there, in God. That's how you're up there in heavenly places. Okay. Going back to John 17, verse 24. So I know we think about that and we think about, oh, when we have our glorified bodies, we're going to be with the Lord in heaven forever. That's true. But it actually happened when you got saved as well. Okay. The Lord didn't wait. He's excited to have you be part of his family. Praise the Lord. John 17, verse 24. 
that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And here we have the Lord once again testifying in a prayer that he, the Jesus of the Holy Bible, definitely is not the Jesus of the New World Translation, the Jesus of Watchtower Society, and definitely not the Jesus of Islam. In Hebrews 1, the Bible says, you don't have to go there, God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken unto us by his Son, who is who? The express image of his person, the image of the invisible God, okay? his glory, the brightness of his glory and who's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Son of God is God manifest in the flesh, and not this whole archangel business. Okay? And not only that, notice that the love that Jesus had from the Father is something he had before the foundation of the world. Well, how does that work if he was born about 33-some years before this prayer? Okay? That seems kind of weird, but he's God. And Jesus is the Word made flesh. See? And Ephesians 3 verse 9 tells you in the Word of God. Now, if you have the New World Translation, it won't say this. Okay? Might explain why you don't recognize who Jesus is. You need to get the right Bible. Okay? Ephesians 3 verse 9. The Word of God in English, the King James Bible says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, so we're at the foundation. You see that? The beginning. So we're right here in the world. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Creator. You see that? Now, I'm trying to remember what it says in the New World Translation. I just know that it doesn't, it doesn't say by Jesus Christ. That I can confirm. It says something else. Uh, it might even cut out Jesus completely. Who created all things, period. I, I'd have to check. But it doesn't give this testimony of who the Lord is. See? Because somebody, okay, his name was Russell, and his other buddy was Rutherford, okay? somebody's, Started with the King James Bible and said, we hate this doctrine, okay? We need to get another Bible. And so they came up with that. Let me cut out everything that shows that the Son is actually God. There's one of them. Okay. Continuing on in this context, verse 17, Ephesians 3, verse 17. Notice that the Lord, he wanted the same love that he had with the Father from the foundation of the world bestowed towards each and every one of us this morning who are in his church. Yeah. And in verse 17 it says, That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Amen. You're justified by faith. You're born again by faith through this grace wherein you stand. Okay? That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, that's what you're grounded in, the love of God, you're rooted in that now because you're in the root of the stem of Jesse now. You're in Jesus. Okay. I'm going to read this, verse 18, I can't help it. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Very interesting verse there, we'll get back to that. Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ. Why are you rooted and grounded in love? Why is the Lord dwelling in your heart by faith? So that you can know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. See that? How do you become perfected? Because you have the fullness of God in you and manifested through your entire being, body, soul, and spirit. Okay. Now, I like verse 18 because that's caused a lot of people to pontificate four dimensions and all these types of wild stuff. Okay. Now, I get it. It's a weird verse. Okay. In three dimensions, you only need three of those. Okay. But let me give you an idea of how to interpret that okay, if you're curious. Let's say I'm inside of a door, okay? Like that door over there, okay? There's a breadth, there's a length and a height in front of me, but there's also a depth below me if this place had a basement. That's how you can keep it 3D without thinking all this other stuff that uh, Einstein made up, okay? Let's give you an idea, okay? But 
Pe people like to talk about that's the shape of the universe and all this. That's, the universe isn't really in the context. So. Okay. What that is, is the dimensions of the manifold, because manifolds are multiple dimensions, wisdom of God. See that? You're encased inside of that wisdom, and the Lord's trying to show you all the extensions, including its substructure, which holds it up, the foundation which no man can lay, that in that which is laying, which is Jesus Christ. That's what that's talking about. We went over that. We talked about the eternal purpose one time. Okay. Continuing on. Now you can connect this reality in verse 24, okay, so you can understand the doctrine the Lord was praying about earlier in John 17. Okay. So let's go to John 17, verse 21. This is why I skipped the section. Okay. Jesus is God. He's the fullness of God. The fullness of the Godhead bodily is who he is. And so in John 17, verse 21, okay, right after it says that they all may be one, continuing, it says, As thou, Father, art in me, present tense, at the time he prayed it, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And notice that Jesus says that the Father's in him, and he's in the Father at the moment he prays. Okay. So when you read verses like Isaiah 9, verse 6, which talks about unto us a child is born, unto us a son is giving, right? And it says that he shall be called the everlasting father. That's not a joke. That's not symbolism, okay? That's a reality the Lord testified. Now, how does that work? Well, that's a deep study. And we've gone one over that. But the point is, Jesus Christ is the fullness of God body. Either you believe that or you don't. And that's where it starts. Then everything else flows from there. Okay. But he believed it when he prayed this. He said, he's praying to the Father and he says that the Father is in him. And I'm in you. Okay. Now, you often go, you know, this is important because if you don't realize as Christian, you might get caught up in the ideas of second blessing and all this stuff. Okay. Did you receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues? Well, I ask people, do they receive the Father? They don't know how to respond to that. See? Technically, when you receive Jesus, you receive the whole the whole package. He's a multivitamin. Okay, that's a Pastor Caesar statement there. That's what he is. You get all of God at once. See. So, but this is this is what the Lord testifies. How to reconcile that is a whole different thing. But he seemed to recognize that reality, and he mentioned that in John 14 verse 9 when he was talking right to Philip, right out of eye. You see that I am the Father? You're, you're one of those modalists. Oh, no. Modalists hate me, too. Okay? It's just that the Godhead's a complex thing. There's facets of both in there. You can't ignore one verse to accept and lift up another. They're all the Word of God, and they all need to be magnified. You need to reduce yourself. Okay? That might help you see it. Or at least believe the words and worry about understanding it later when the Lord will teach us in the millennium. Because he, he promises to do that. Okay. Go back to John 17, verse 25. Yeah. The fullness of the, of the Godhead is very complicated and difficult to understand. But it's easy to believe. 1 John 5, verse 7. There's the Godhead. Okay. Colossians 2, verse 9. There's the Godhead. Acts 17 mentions the God. It's not something that's made out of stone. It's greater than everything material. Okay. Going to verse 25 here, John 17, verse 25. Okay. We're going to see the Lord here concluding his prayer and giving kind of a, a summary, if you will. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Talking about the eleven and also those that come later, which is us. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Okay. Notice that the Lord ends by making sure that we recognize that the key to knowing the Father is knowing him. See? It's Jesus Christ in you that manifests the Father. I know we kind of went over that. 
the Father only reveals himself to those who know the Son. Okay? But then the Father's got to reveal the Son so you can get saved, and the Son reveals the Father. That's how it works. Okay, Luke 10, verse 22, I believe. And this is why we always preach the importance of the doctrine of Christ, right? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God, because they're a package deal. You can only have the Father if you have the Son. We have many people today in different religions who say they know God, but they do not know the Jesus Christ of the Bible. According to John, they're liars. They need to get saved. And John said that based on the Lord's Prayer right here. John seemed to understand that reality. And so what is this specific commandment that the Lord gives to every single person today? Go to 1 John 3 and 1 here. 1 John 3. The Lord is praying that his, the love that the Father has for him can be given to anyone who believes the words that the 11 here gave for us today. And so it's true for anybody listening this morning who is not saved. Yeah. And this is the command that the Father has for you. First yeah. John 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment, commandment of God the Father in the context, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. See that? He says, I will give them thy name and will declare it. Through the name of Jesus Christ, which the Father guides you to, you're going to recognize that his name is good. So good that he went and died for your sins account. And he rose again, proving that he was God manifest in the flesh. And solely through him and his work that you may be saved from your sins. Because he didn't die for his own sins. He died for yours and for mine and for everybody else's. Just to give you the opportunity to read this verse here. And recognize it. The Father just wants you to believe on Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then for those who have received the name of Jesus Christ, received his gospel so that they may be saved, the second part of the new commandment, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And the Lord... After he gives you the glorification that comes with you being born again, he wants to continue to allow you to glorify God in your life as he walks with you, going to that end point where you can live for him forever in an incorruptible body and glory. That was his goal. Just before he went through the hour of darkness going to the cross of Calvary, he prayed for us. What a great God. I don't think of God all the time when I should but I'm glad he thought of me at every moment. He thought it necessary. And it's because of prayers like this here, this Lord's Prayer right here, that I know that God, he's always with me and he'll never leave me or forsake me. Do you know that? Yeah. We're getting close to the, this Christmas holiday here. Yeah. Have you reflected on that great gift the Lord has given to every single person? Asking them to simply receive it and open it up. Yeah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us that you prayed for us. Allow us to recognize the greatness of this prayer and allow us to be an answer to that prayer as we make the choice to not only get saved and get born again, but to also make the decision to submit our lives to you because it's simply our reasonable service. And Father, uh, we give